So my Tuesday and Wednesday got pretty weird this week due to the fact that a number of bigger name conservatives took to Twitter to label me as an anti-Semite, a bigot, or some combination of the two. Now, this was jarring for me for a number of reasons, but first and foremost, because I am not an anti-Semite and I have the receipts to back that up, which we'll get to in a minute. But before we go down that rabbit hole, I guess I have to walk you back through some Twitter history about how we got here. Earlier this week, the U.S. House of Representatives took a vote on a resolution. Side note, resolutions are stupid. They're mostly just symbolic ways for Congress to demonstrate our virtue signal. Fortunately, this resolution does absolutely nothing to genuinely counter the scourge of anti-Semitism, nor does it help bring us together with the unity of purpose that this topic merits. Rather, it is another attempt in a long series of veiled efforts by the GOP to weaponize Jewish lives for political gains. This particular resolution conflated all anti-Zionism with being anti-Semitic. And it's really important to understand why they would do this. Essentially, if they can get you to vote and say that anybody who holds anti-Zionist views is anti-Semitic, you're then going to have a really hard time not voting on the funding package for Israel that is coming down the pipeline any minute now. It also works out for people who very much want to see that funding package get passed that if you vote against this kind of resolution, they can immediately try to label you and smear you as a racist. And sure enough, that's exactly what they did. But despite the fact that it was very obvious how this vote was going to be used, 14 members of Congress still voted against it. 13 of them were Democrats, and one of them was a Republican. He is Congressman Thomas Massey from Kentucky, and he tends to be one of the more libertarian-minded Republicans in Congress. He also tends to be one of the most based anti-war voices out there. This guy is so consistent on the issue, you can't get anything by him. And during the push to fund Ukraine, most Republicans were praising him for that. But now that Israel's on the line, he's not getting the same respect for that energy and being consistent and principled, which is what we should hope to see our representatives do. His vote was met with immediate backlash, and this comes on top of the fact that APAC, which is the large pro-Israel PAC that sends a ton of money to Congress, spends a ton of money lobbying, and ultimately works to get your tax dollars sent overseas, has been trying to get him out of office for a while now because he's been speaking out against this funding package to Israel. He even said on Twitter that they spent over $90,000, they and other opponents, trying to attack him. So they were hot on his trail, and the backlash started immediately. Now, Massey took to Twitter to troll his haters back, which he tends to do, and he posted this meme. In it, he basically says that Congress is turning their back on American patriotism or the America First agenda, and instead is supporting Zionism. Now, it's important to know that Massey has a pretty large MAGA base, even though he's more libertarian. He also has a lot of Trump supporters. And while I disagree with Trump supporters on a wide array of issues and public policies, one thing I think they get right is that they tend to be very anti-war. And when they say America first, they do mean it. They mean keep our tax dollars here, that we shouldn't be sending our money overseas because uh, one, we are broke, and two, our tax dollars should be going to help our own people. Up until the attacks on Israel, most Republicans were in agreement because they needed to stay in the Trump crowd's graces. But now they're very quickly turning their backs on that America first agenda. And it's this that Thomas Massey was calling out. But if there's one thing you should know about D.C., it's this. Most congressmen and senators are bought and paid for by the military industrial complex. Both Democrats and Republicans take that cash and at almost every turn they will fold and vote to fund various wars overseas because they are beholden to these special interests. And that's why Thomas Massey incurred a tweet from Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who's a Democrat, condemning his vote. Do you remember when Democrats used to be anti-war? It's been a minute. Now, Chuck Schumer quote tweeted Massey's tweet and said, Representative Massey, you're a city member of Congress. This is anti-Semitic, disgusting, dangerous, and exactly the type of thing I was talking about in my Senate address. Take this down. Um, first and foremost, I don't think members of Congress should be policing the free speech of other members of Congress who represent people in the United States and their districts ever. But secondarily, there is absolutely nothing anti-Semitic about this post. And if there's one thing I can't stand, it's a freaking bully. So I came to Thomas Massey's defense. I wrote, screw this, Representative Thomas Massey said nothing wrong. Anti-Zionism is not and has never been anti-Semitic. There are tons of anti-Zionist Jews for crying out loud. This is an intentionally disingenuous comparison that the military industrial complex and its puppets need to justify their foreign policy and shut down justified dissent. 
In doing so, they undermine the true threats of racism Jews face, all to justify war crimes and shipping our tax dollars overseas. Now, they say a hit dog hollers, and that's why I know this defense of Thomas Massey and his position was effective. Because the warmongers and the neocons came out in droves to attack and malign me. So after I tweeted my defense of Thomas Massey and his position, it appeared to aggravate a pretty interesting coalition of voices on the right. Josh Hammer, who is the senior editor at large for Newsweek, anyways, he goes on to say, scratch a libertarian hard enough and you'll often find the Jew hater hiding in plain sight all along. At least it's nice to confirm that Cox is not merely a moron, well established via a lengthy track record of EFC, but a bigot to boot. Bethany Mendel, she quote tweeted me in one of my other responses to Josh Hammer where I had said, it's amusing how quickly neocons also call everything racist when they aren't getting their way politically. Further proof, there's very little difference between these people and progressives, horseshoe theory and politics never misses, which is of course the theory that if you go far right or far left enough, you will find that these people start believing and behaving very similarly. She quote tweeted that and said, people have become more comfortable letting their anti-Semitism out into the open. Most of them were not surprising. Hannah seemed nice and this one is actually disappointing. I decided to respond to Bethany and I said, this is a disappointing smear from Bethany as we've always been friendly on here and as I thought she was a pretty decent conservative voice. Since the terrorist attacks, her posts have become increasingly erratic, so I'm going to handle this with kids' gloves, despite the tongue lashing it deserves, as I think she's frail right now and speaking out of pocket. I went on to say there are plenty of anti-Semites out there, and it's frankly a scary moment in history, conflating good people who don't support the U.S. intervening in war or shipping our tax dollars overseas with racist is absurd. That's not even an anti-Zionist view, definitionally. And that's mine and Massey's position. And then lastly, there was Cassie Dillon. Um, she is a conservative commentator who converted to Judaism herself, although she converted to the Orthodox tradition. And she also, quote, tweeted another post of mine where I mentioned that I had actually been zooming in for my weekly Judaism class as this whole thing went down. I'm in San Francisco this week, so I was zooming in for it. And I went on to say that it's important to know that while Newsweek hacks are trying to conflate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, the rabbi teaching my course is specifically speaking out against Israel's actions and conflating its government with the faith. Because guess what? A lot of Jewish people recognize it endangers them to conflate all Jews with the actions of the Israel government. But Cassie quote tweeted that and said, hi, as someone who has never stepped foot in a reformed temple, I will only go into an orthodox shul. I'm going to reply to this anyways. It's quite ridiculous to push forward a stance from an unnamed reform rabbi and pretend it speaks to the Jewish people. Political anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. It's not the faith when you convert to Judaism, you are joining the Jewish people and you should appreciate the Jewish state that protects the Jewish. Cassie would go on to say that the only people who are truly Jewish are people who converted via the Orthodox tradition, which I just always think it's so interesting when individuals believe they're the arbiters of other people's religious experiences or validity. Like, I can't imagine having the audacity to tell another person whether or not their faith, their religion was valid. Anyways, I quote tweeted Cassie and I said, I'm not the one pretending to speak for all Jewish people, though. I'm the one pointing out that there are people of devout Jewish faith with political views across the spectrum, including anti-Zionist views, which in most contexts seem to be more of an opinion that Israel's government is acting unethically and shouldn't be backed by the U.S. versus that Israel shouldn't exist. But even in the latter category, there are Jews who hold that view, pretty sure mostly within more orthodox traditions, which is 100% factual. I learned that in my Judaism 101 class that they're mocking. It's really weird to watch how quickly some Jewish people turn on even other Jewish people when they don't hold the same political views on here. That seems like a greater commitment to political views than the faith. I'll say this, I've never seen that kind of behavior from people at the Reform Temple. I went on to say faith is separate from politics and should be, otherwise your religion is just an extension of your political party, and not everyone who holds different political views than you does so because they're racist. That's a woke democratic tactic that's disgusting when used on the left and shouldn't be tolerated on the right. Obviously, there's the need to define a couple basic terms around here before we can really get into that discussion. So let's pause and pull up Wikipedia. According to Wikipedia, Zionism is a nationalist movement that emerged in the 19th century to enable the establishment of a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. And according to them, anti-Zionism is opposition to Zionism. And they go on to say that although anti-Zionism is a heterogeneous phenomenon, all its proponents agree that the creation of the modern state of Israel and the movement to create a sovereign Jewish state in the region of Palestine, the biblical land of Israel, was flawed or unjust in some way. Until World War II, anti-Zionism was widespread among Jews for varying reasons. Orthodox Jews opposed Zionism on religious grounds as preempting the Messiah, while secular Jews felt uncomfortable with the idea that Jewish peoplehood was a national or ethnic identity. 
And then it seems we must define actual anti-Semitism, which is hostility to, prejudice towards, or discrimination against Jews. Now, these are the technical definitions, but per usual, when we start using language out in the real world, definitions can grow, they can start to mean other things, they're used more widely than their technical definitions, and I think that's largely what has happened here. So I want to preface this with saying that there are a wide range of stances you can find someone to hold under Zionism and anti-Zionism, and there are a number of policies that relate to that. Typically, when I encounter people who describe themselves as Zionist, they are staunch believers in a nationalist government in Israel. They virtually think Israel can do no wrong. They very much believe that the U.S. should be propping up Israel's government and its defense fund. And they tend to not really be concerned with any of the factors that anti-Zionists are concerned about, particularly the plight of the Palestinian people. Similarly, anti-Zionism, while technically it refers to people who do not believe Israel has a right to exist, I see the term used far more widely by people who are critical of Israel's government, who are concerned with the way the Palestinians are being treated, who have supported a two-state solution in the past so that both Palestine and Israel would have a home in this land. It also tends to refer to people who are very critical of the U.S. government's propping up of Israel's government, of the foreign policy, both of the U.S. and Israel, which is highly interventionist. It doesn't tend to just mean people who don't think Israel has a right to be there, but it can include that. As I hope you can tell by now, there are a myriad of reasons for why somebody might hold anti-Zionist views, and very few of them actually relate to anti-Semitism. Now, I do think it's fair to say that people who are anti-Semitic, who actually hate Jews, who want to discriminate against Jews, who spread lies and conspiracies about Jews, these kinds of people probably are anti-Zionist. They probably don't believe that Israel has a right to exist. But I don't think that that goes in the other direction in saying that everybody who's anti-Zionist has anti-Semitic views. This actually reminds me of the immigration debate on the right, which I'm highly critical of because I really like immigrants, I really like immigration, I think it's a net positive. But there are many who would say anybody who holds anti-immigration views on the right is a bigot or a racist. And I don't think that's fair. Are some of the people who hold anti-immigration views bigots and racist? Definitely. But is everybody who holds anti-immigration views coming from that spot? No. I think most of them are economically illiterate, but I don't think that they all necessarily come from a bad place. And I think that's how we should think about the anti-Zionism movement. There are definitely some racists and anti-Semites within it, but the vast majority of people are likely not coming from that place. So why then would people be trying so hard to conflate these terms, you might be asking, and that's the right question. As you've probably noticed on the left, calling people racist is a very popular way to shut down dissent, to try to malign people who you want to stop the influence of, and a way to get the outcomes you want politically. If you can't win the argument, just call somebody racist, right? That tactic is disgusting and foul and low IQ on the left, and it is every bit as bad on the right, which is what we're seeing right now. Throughout our history, we have very frequently seen this kind of tactic used when it comes to people who hold anti-war views, though. Dating all the way back to the Espionage Act, when we tried to jail a well-known socialist at the time for speaking out against the war, to modern times where we saw people like the Dixie Chicks or Ron Paul or Barbara Lee, who spoke out against George W. Bush's war on terror and domestic police state, labeled as terrorist sympathizers, anti-American, or blamed for atrocities in the past. You're basically saying that we should take our marching orders from Al-Qaeda. If they want us off the Arabian Peninsula, we should leave. No. I'm saying, I'm saying we should take our marching orders from our Constitution. We should not go to war. We should not go to war without a declaration. We should not go to war when it's an aggressive war. This is an aggressive invasion. We've committed the invasion of this war. And it's hurt our men fighting overseas who no, think their cause is just. Men. Is this a matter of free speech or bad manners? Their opinion is so ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. I think they are the ditzy twits. These are the <laughs> dumbest, dumbest bimbos, with due respect, I have seen. These are callow, foolish women who deserve to be slapped around. Absolutely. The Violence Center is working with Greenville Police to provide extra security surrounding the Dixie Chicks concert. Hey, that's it. Congressman Paul, I've heard him now in many debates talking about bringing our troops home and about the war in Iraq and how it's failed. And uh, I want to tell you that that kind of isolationism, sir, is what caused World War II. We allowed... We allowed... We allow, allow him his answer. Allow him his answer, please. 
More recently, we also saw people who spoke out against our funding of Ukraine labeled as pro-Putin, dictator lovers, Russian spies. Are you noticing a trend here? Because I am. So it was almost inevitable, actually, when the terrorist attacks happened in Israel, that anybody who did not support getting involved in that war would be labeled anti-Semitic. Doesn't make it any less sinister just because it's predictable. I've even seen some very pro-war types like Max Boot try to take it even further and say anybody who uses the term neocon or is critical of the neocon foreign agenda is an anti-Semite. Wouldn't that be so nice if you could shut up all criticism of the neocon agenda? You wish. What I think is really interesting right now is that the right has become increasingly anti-war in recent years. Again, mostly due to Trump and his influence, but also we've got to give credit to Ron Paul, who was holding strong since the early 2000s, despite the various attacks he incurred for that position. And we saw most Republicans stay strong on this front through the massive push to fund Ukraine over the past two years. But as we're seeing, Israel's current conflict has many conservative commentators backtracking on the America first anti-war sentiments they were proclaiming to get favor in the Trump era, which I think most would call grifting. The bottom line here is that we cannot afford to fund Israel even if we wanted to, even if it was a good idea to do so. I don't think it is. We are broke. Americans cannot afford groceries. They can't get basic housing. Meanwhile, we have sent Israel hundreds of millions of dollars that they use, by the way, to give their people free health care. Now, I'm not in support of large welfare programs like that in the United States or anywhere else, but I do think it's seriously jacked up that we take 30% plus from each American out of their salaries, and then we use it to send overseas so that those people have a higher quality of life. Make that make sense. If you're mad that you can't afford the cost of living right now, the military industrial complex and our war spending is a major reason why. Inflation occurs because we are printing so many dollars. We print so many dollars because we're spending money we don't have. It all traces back to this. Furthermore, involving ourselves in proxy wars, or in any wars really, has very negative consequences. For the record, we have not really won a war since World War II. Like seriously, think about it. We have lost every foreign conflict we've entered. On top of that, we have destabilized regions. We've gotten millions of innocent people killed. We've incurred blowback and terrorist attacks on our own country due to our reckless foreign policy. We've bankrupted our country. We spent over $2 trillion to replace the Taliban with the Taliban in Afghanistan. We've sent over $75 billion to Ukraine, who is, by the way, losing to Russia. They are going to lose, as most of us with any common sense predicted all along. War is heinous at all times. Its atrocities should be avoided at all cost. There is never justification for the U.S. getting involved in any war unless we are actually facing an existential threat. Period. End of story. I'm with you. Anybody should be able to say what happened October 7th is disgusting and heinous and, and should be unilaterally condemned. There is no ifs, ands, and buts about it. But I think you do have a situation where it's a chicken and egg question. I do think blowback is a real thing. I do think kids and civilians have been harmed on both sides of this conflict for many, many, many years. And so it is not within me to rush in and and to, you know, just stake my flag in the sand when it comes to this conflict. I think we need to be able to do what he did, which is to say, I hate terrorism. I hate deaths. I hate any kids being killed. I hate war. I hate it. There are a lot of people in this country who agree with me on that anti-war stance, and the numbers are growing. And I think that's why you see this kind of conduct from warmongers and far-right conservatives who very much want to keep the status quo going. They're scared, their views are losing in popularity, and they know it. So they're turning to the less playbook to try to shut down people like me. When it comes to anti-Zionists, there are some who share my anti-war stance. There are others who have ethical qualms with the government of Israel's behavior. There are Jewish people themselves who are anti-Zionists. And then there are anti-Semites. But the need to distinguish between these factions has never been more clear. We should all easily condemn the violence that occurred in Israel on October 7th, and I have. There are a lot of people like us who feel hesitant to weigh in because they recognize how complex the situation is. And Edward Snowden was saying, you know, we have to resist the errors of the Bush movement during this time period. And what you would think you could see people say is that terrorism is never okay. Violence is never acceptable. And we can have sympathy for the people of Palestine. We can want to find a solution. We can recognize that Israel has done really bad things to Palestinian people as well. Um, but just the, the bare minimum should be condemning Hamas. We should all be concerned with the rise of racism, no matter who is the target? And I have been. By this, this 
challenge to the monopoly of violence by this shifting of the balance of power, then they would not be human. I was exhilarated. Yeah, and you know, this is an isolated event that we're calling out, but there's been a series of them across college campuses over the past 11, 12 days since the terrorist attacks where we've seen rallies supporting Hamas. We've seen people tearing down um, like flyers supporting the hostages. A lot of people have said, if you just realize there's a problem at Harvard, you know, you've not been paying attention for long, which is so true. But I, I saw a couple of tweets I want to read out kind of just calling this out because it's absolutely correct. Liz Wolf from Reason, she said, misgender someone on a college campus to the gulag you go. Say you're exhilarated when watching bloodthirsty Hamas terrorists slaughter innocents. Here, have some tenure. These are the same people that would run off like Daily Wire commentators from their college campuses and the college would basically like support that or not punish the students for doing it. And now they support free speech. No, you don't. No, you, you don't. don't. And at the very least, you could still say we support free speech. So we're going to allow these students to demonstrate, but we condemn it. It's disgusting. But what we shouldn't be doing is calling people racist or anti-Semites because they disagree with us on a political policy position. This is a woke tactic too many on the right are now using. And again, it's very low IQ. For the record, I have a long and very documented history of speaking out against systemic racism, both on a policy level and in the media. It comes to gun crimes, gun laws were put into place to explicitly block black people from being able to access their rights to self-defense in this country and boy do they still work to this day black people are far more likely to be charged with gun crimes they are more likely to be arrested and sentenced and sentenced for longer time periods when they are caught as a whole there are still so many areas across this country where we are continuing to see the government harm people of color at disproportionate rates and what that should tell you is that we need to limit this freaking government and get it out of people's ways and giving it the power to do this to people. That's the end game. What I think is interesting is I've been sticking my neck out to talk about systemic racism on the right for about seven or eight years now. And I do say sticking my neck out because the wrath and pushback and gnashing of teeth that I receive when I talk about these issues on the right is wild. It's really interesting because so many conservatives never want to talk about racism whatsoever, but particularly when it pertains to the government. And I just, it doesn't track to me because as a limited government person, like, you know, the government is awful and corrupt and inefficient. Like, why are you coming to its honor when people say it's also racist? It is interesting to me now, though, that the same people who would have pushed back on me for calling out systemic racism and working to eradicate it for all these years are now wanting to use racism as a way to shut people up. It really is like the horseshoe of politics when you go so far right and so far left you end up acting the same. What makes these smears against me even more malicious though is that I have very publicly been exploring a conversion to Judaism for most of this year. In fact, I was actually zooming in for my Judaism 101 class from San Francisco when this started going down on Twitter this week. I'm pretty sure anti-Semites and bigots don't explore conversions to a religion that they have racist views towards. But when confronted with this information, did they apologize or back down? No, sweeties, no. Instead, they attacked my rabbi, wrote off my interest in the religion because I was pursuing a reform track versus orthodox, and proceeded to mock people in the reform tradition, say that they were self-hating Jews, say that only orthodox Jews were real Jews. Like, I'm pretty sure all of this actually is highly anti-Semitic. This is like when people on the left call a black person who holds views that are not within the mainstream of the Democratic Party, Uncle Tom's. It's disgusting and foul and heinous and racist when they do it. And the same thing applies to these people doing it on the right. It's inexcusable. I think it's understandable for people in Jewish communities to feel a heightened sense of fear right now. Anti-Semitism is on the rise and these are very scary times. What I would do if I were afraid about a rise in anti-Semitism is not go and try to make up more anti-Semites out of thin air online. That's weird. It's not the behavior of somebody who's afraid. That's actually the behavior of somebody who feels they have politically the upper hand, wants to keep it, and is trying to shut down anybody who might dissent against them. It's major Karen energy. Furthermore, as somebody who actually is concerned about systemic racism, racism in general, and trying to eradicate it, this kind of behavior pisses me off because it seriously sets that kind of work back. When you conduct yourselves like this, you become like the boy who cried wolf. Nobody's going to believe you when racism does rear its ugly head. 
And you're going to find you have fewer and fewer allies to come to your defense when the need is there because you've maligned and smeared them with this kind of disgusting accusation. For the record, I actually don't hold strong opinions on Israel. I couldn't say that I fall into the anti-Zionist camp or the Zionist camp, and that's because unlike apparently all of my haters, I actually do my due diligence and research before I run my mouth about a subject. And to be honest, I don't know enough about Israel or that region to really weigh in meaningfully on that subject matter. What I do know is that it is anti-free speech to try to shut down dissent and smear people with disgusting labels in order to get your war agenda through. And what I do know is that we should not be sending our tax dollars overseas, full stop, to anybody but especially to fund wars that kill innocent people, that are destabilizing regions, that are sure to incur blowback, and that as a whole would make America less physically safe and less economically secure. I'm not the first person to be unjustly smeared for my anti-war stance, which by the way, must be repeated, is not even an anti-Zionist stance. My stance is that the US needs to keep our tax dollars here, stay out of wars, and make sure that we uphold free speech on both the left and apparently on the right. That's not actually an anti-Zionist view, but I will continue to stand up for the free speech rights of those who do hold anti-Zionist views against these kind of disgusting smears, even if it gets me smeared in the process. And like many of our icons in the past who have been consistently anti-war, no matter what it costs them, who have stuck their neck out, who have done the right thing consistently, no matter what they were called, I think I too will be proven right in the long run when it comes to this conflict. And anybody who's cheering for war or our involvement in it will have this stain on their record. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Leave me a comment. Let me know your thoughts. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, and until next time, stay based.